one second. Okay, so hi, thanks for coming here to listen to me. So, and thanks for the TWF for amazing conference so far and for getting me here. So, this talk is called Exploring the Universal Library. My name is Szymon Kaliski and you find me at szymonkaliski.com and at flowcontrol.io, that's my small little studio. And I'm on Twitter at Szymon K. So, uh, first of all, I'll be talking today about a bunch of seemingly unrelated things, and some of them might be very ephemeral, so there's going to be a bit of hand-waving, so just bear with me for a while. And first of all, I'd like to point out that most of the thoughts I have are actually stolen, and so are thoughts in your heads, and we steal them from people smarter than us, from books and movies. So I'd just like to point out some of my inspirations that you should really check out. First of all, it's Carson Schmidt, who is an amazing code artist, and then Devin Lynn Vega, who is a game designer and who does amazing things with, with code as well, but in a totally different way than Karsten. There is Marcin Ignatz, who is a data artist, with whom I had pleasure to work on a few occasions. And there's Jörg Eulis Borges and his famous short stories. And there are many, many others, really. So, first let's start with a few words about me. I have my own little studio, it's called Flow Control, and I try to only work on projects which really interest me in some way, because otherwise, What's the point? So, I'm a creative technologist, but I don't really like this term because I don't really feel that creative most of the time. I just like putting technology in certain places, and most of the stock is going to be how I think or like to think about the things I do and how I, uh, how I shape them. So, let's start with, with the term of universal library. It it's comes from a very short story by Kurt Laswitz, with the same name, universal library, which later inspired Borges to write his infamous Library of Babel. So, who here has read Library of Babel? Okay, that's great. So, you should really check it out. It's only, I think, 20 pages long or so. It's a story about infinite library containing infinite hexagonal rooms with uh, each of these rooms has, I think, 500 books filled with all the possible permutations of letters in English alphabet. So there's a complete set of Shakespeare's work in there. There's your life story up to this point right now, listening to me speak, and until you die. And there's also all the books that should never be written. There, there are books filled with letter A for the whole 500 pages. And there are librarians exploring this place. And um, at some point, they come up with the idea to start burning books, which make no sense, um, aiming to leave the library only with, with books which have meaning. Uh, but then, because library is infinite, it takes really, really long time, so language evolves, and they come to the conclusion that maybe they burn books that really made sense right now, but didn't when they started. But then again, there's infinite number of, of books just differing by a comma somewhere, so we shouldn't be that worried. But what I'm aiming at is that language is extremely inspiring for me. And uh, I'm talking here not only about spoken language or written language, but language as a way of thinking. And there's this powerful hypothesis uh, called Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, which has been disproven by now, but it's still a very interesting idea, which says that you can only think things for which you have thoughts. So you basically live and experience and create limited by, by the language you possess. And again, I'm not really talking about spoken language or written language, but language as a way of thinking. And there's also another quote from Wittgenstein, which is, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. So try keeping that in mind throughout my talk, because we'll be exploring some different languages for the next 20 minutes or so. But there's also one more story, which is a biblical story of Babel, where people started building a tower into the heaven to meet God, and he didn't really like it, so he created more languages so people couldn't communicate. But from my perspective, keeping the sapir Whorf hypothesis in mind, it would only give them more tools to, to create, to, uh, to think about things, so they would build the tower even faster. So I don't really get this one. Let's, let's start talking about different languages and start with language for matter. So, right now we have things like CNC milling and, and 3D printing, so, and it's only going, only going to get more 
And it's very easy right now to move from digital space to physical. It's very quick and, and very simple. And there are also people working, and we'll get there someday, about, on building things from the most single atoms. But I'm pretty sure none of us would like to work in atomic assembler. So my, my thinking here is that we need more tools and more ways of thinking and shaping matter in computers. So here's a very short demo when, where I'm playing with a bit of a closure code. It's, it's really, really simple, but uh, the important idea here is that I never think where a single vertex goes, where all the points are. I'm starting with circle and then sampling it three, time to get, three times to get a polygon, thus getting a triangle. But I never think where each one of those points comes. I can extrude it to make it 3D, and I can also move very quickly to 2D. There's a set of libraries from, from Karsten Schmidt called Think, and it allows you to very easily think about shapes and matter in terms of a pipeline of transformations on things instead of calculating where the points go and how to triangulate meshes and, and how to do all those complicated things. So Karsten has been doing really amazing stuff with this, so you should really ch check THI Dot ng, which is his set of, of libraries for closure. Uh, this is one of his projects where he created kind of DNA of those transformations, which lets him grow those shapes. And I've been also toying with a similar idea, which is not really mine and, and not really new, but uh, growing uh, things in computers with uh, something resembling biological processes. So this is heavily inspired by how algae grows. But the idea here is we can very easily 3D print it. It's ready for a, for a STL or OBJ export. And we can also scan space, grow this on a physical space in digital medium, and put it back in. So we have very fluid ways of moving between physical and digital and, and back to physical. And that's why we need more. We need more tools and more ways of thinking about this. And the language is language for data, and I, by now I know most of you are developers, so you work with data uh, your whole days, basically. But I, I really like to look for data in, in very um, strange places and not only databases. So one of those things is looking at your code as a data set. And there is a term coming from Lisp, which is homoacionicity, which means that you describe your data the same way you describe your code. So it just really forces you into a mindset of thinking about your, uh, the data set you have and, and the code you have that works on those data in the same way. So uh, I'm sure you have seen some somewhere as expressions. This is the thing on the top. So on the left, we have multiplication function two and three. And on the right, we have list of multiplication function two and three. And those things are very similar. On the right, we have data set. On the left, we have code that actually runs. And we can swap with them extremely easy. So it really puts you in a mindset to, to look at things from different perspective, which is really, really important. Uh, but you can also, in other languages, go with a parser and go back to abstract syntax tree and always look at the, at the code you have as a data set. So one short demo I have for you is when I've been, I've been playing with shaders for a bit. They are actually WebGL. And I really hate this moment where I want to interact with something. But in order to do this, I need a UI. I need to, go to switch back to JavaScript, create the UI part, do the piping between CPU and GPU. And then I can switch back and move the sliders. And then I come up with another idea. So I need to do it again and again. And the, the feedback loop is extremely long. So I wrote a very simple piece of code which analyzes the abstract syntax tree of the shader and then grabs uh, all the variables that start with the UI, those, those two letters, and then based on, on the type of that variable, I create appropriate UI. So here you can see I, for example, have uniform of vector two, so it's two values and I get two sliders, basically. But it all happens behind the scenes and for me, and it's only because I could look at the code as a data set that I could do that. So data as relations. And I really, really enjoy looking at, at data as a, 
as graphs. And one of the earliest experiments I've made was, was this. It actually makes sounds, but it's deliberately not here because it's not that nice. I, it was in the early stages of web audio, and I never came back to fix it. But anyways, you build up this graph, uh, placing those dots and connecting them with lines. And there are little green dots uh, or grayish on this screen, which go around, and when they hit the big one, they make a sound. And depending on the position of the dot, the sound is a little bit different. So you start thinking about musical composition in terms of space. And this is something that I really like of uh, putting you in this unfamiliar situation and trying to force your brain to look at things in a different way. And I had a chance to work on something, uh, work on an interactive movie with a set of filmmakers. Uh, filmmakers. So the, uh, the basic idea is that it runs in your browser, and at the end of, of a scene, you can, you can choose if my, my interactor should go left or right, um, or do something else. It's, it's up to the, the filmmakers. When we started working on the project, we really thought about only having like six, seven scenes, and then maybe two alternative endings, so something really small. But me, coming up from developer background, I really didn't want to hard code anything, so I've made them this, this very simple tool where they can drag and drop the movies, connect them together, and it grows out a, a, a JSON file structure, which then, which then lets me make the, the front end alive. But when they started playing with this, uh, they really saw a power of, of, of connecting those things together. And we ended up with a story like this. And it was really only because of the tools we've made for the project, for the little language we, we've built for working with this medium that we were creating, we were able to do that. We would never think about this when we started. And for me, graphs are also really powerful to, to express computations. And this is one, one of the tools I'm working for a company called Helmut Lobby, which is a company founded by DJs. And they have this idea of uh, very easily transforming MIDI signals, so something coming from your audio co uh, uh, controllers, acting, this acting as a, as a middleman, and then coming back to like Ableton or whatever digital audio workstation you are using. So allowing you to very easily uh, doing complex stuff with live MIDI data. And this wouldn't really work as a set of OK, not OK radio buttons or whatever. And it's also not really a language. It's for sure not Turing complete. But I'm not sure in what space it really relies. But I'm sure that it puts you in, a, in this place of of looking at, at the thing in a, in a different way, which for me is, is really interesting. So let's talk about language for art. And just as a disclaimer, this is art with a small letter A, because don't get me wrong, there's a set of amazing artists doing really powerful and deep stuff with computers, and I'm, I'm not one of them. I just like playing with stuff. And for me, when you work with art in terms of computers, you really need to choose some kind of fabric, so what you focus on. And interaction is an extremely simple one, like the first one that comes to mind, but you can still get out some interesting things out of that. So here's a short video of a project I made with, with my good friend, Marek Strashak, where we created these five deconstructed platonic solids, and each one of them had a little solenoid, which is just a motor that hits things, and you could control them from this simple UI on a touch screen. And depending on how you place these triangles, it, you build up a composition of those clicks. And because all of the platonic solids is a little bit different, they make different sounds when you hit it. So thus, you start creating musical compositions uh, in a gallery context. So one interesting thing for me has been that I'm pretty sure all of the people that have seen this work uh, have computer at home, and I'm also pretty sure very few of them actually ever made co music with a computer. And here they did, just because the interaction was a little bit different. But there are deeper ways where you can look for for interaction. And I helped my my friend Rafael Zapawa, who is amazing composer, uh, with his sensorium project, which is uh, which is based on on the idea of biofeedback. So we have. Con this is actually pretty amazing. We have consumer-grade EEG sensors, so the things you put on your head, and uh, they basically detect the, 
neuron activity near the sensors. And thanks to that and some software, we can infer if you are relaxed or start to meditate or are stressed. We also had galvanic skin response and pulse sensors. So combining all this data together, we were able to infer a bit how you feel, all through the lens of this hardware, not the real, if it ever exists, how you feel, but the, the view of the hardware and software on you. But nevertheless, this then controls the composition that, that Rafa has made. Uh, this is a little bit like a neoclassical score. And it can change and react to how you're feeling. So you end up in this strange position of this feedback loop when the, you start listening to music, which changes based, based on your emotions, and then your emotions change based on that. So you end up in this, in this circle of you and machine working together. And I also had a chance to help another music, uh, musician to uh, play concert using human heartbeats. So uh, I've created these 12 little bracelets which read your pulse from, from your finger. They also had accelerometers, so they detect how you move. And based on that, the uh, tempo of the music changed and the sound changed. So you listening to the music started impacting how the music is being played, even though there was still an artist creating the music. So... Ending back, the, the last slide, I really like that right now we are coming to a conclusion that human bodies and how we act and what we do is actually a huge data set. And there are very, there's a lot of very easy ways to get something out of that. And choosing another fabric when we are with data sets is to actually work with data in terms of, of art. And there's even data art term, which is actually data visualization that you can really understand looking at it. So I worked with Marcin Ignaz under, uh, with his studio variable, uh, I think that was last year or two years back, on the Google I.O., where we created this animation running on 27K display, which was huge. And those dots represent uh, Android uh, devices. Color represents the size of the screen, and they land up on a, on a globe inside, so it's only 30 seconds or so. The inter interesting part of this project for me has been that we started with making tools and exploring, because we got, I don't know how big data set, I think it was one billion devices. So we, we really needed to create our own language, our own way of thinking about this, what does space mean, what does the color mean, where they actually are on the globe, can we infer something from that or need to move somewhere else. So we were rapidly working in terms of shaping our way of thinking about what we've got from Google and we have some pictures that never made it to the final set. So if you are a developer, check out PEXGL, which is Marcin's and friends' library for WebGL. Uh, and yeah, we used that, and it was all rendered in Chrome, so that's pretty amazing. But anyways, while we are still with, with, with art and computers, you can also choose to use algorithms as a fabric. And I don't really have that much time today to, to go deep into that, but I think it poses some very strange ethical questions, like with things uh, like deep neural networks or even procedural generation. If you create code which generates infinite number of artworks, are you the artist? Can you actually sell those artworks? Who, who created them? And can we say computers are creative, or can we give them the same creativity that we have or agree that they are as creative as we are. There's a lot of very interesting questions. I would really encourage you to, to check out this, this YouTube video from PBS IDEA channel, Can Artificial Intelligence Make Art? Uh, Mike there says things that I would love to know and, and explain as well as he does. So just go Google for it. And last thing is language for tools. And there's this powerful quote from Marshall McLuhan who already was mentioned on this conference, which is great. Uh, Marshall McLuhan was a media theorist, and he said that, one of the things he said, of course, is uh, that uh, first we shape our tools, and then they shape us. And I have a little backstory to all of that. So when I started doing my own work, one of the first things I made was my own time tracking system. And I would put in how, much hours, how many hours I've spent on a given project and how much I earned for that project. And the focal point of this tool became this huge table sorted by 
amount of money I made for, per hour. So all my personal projects, the things I do for fun or for explorations, would fall down to the bottom. And it's not like I didn't know they were there because I still have my own to-do list and I know I want to do them, but subconsciously it started hitting me that they have no value. So at the end of, of last year, for almost half a year, I stopped doing any personal work at all. And it ended up, like, I ended up pretty depressed because of that. And only after watching Devin uh, Lulin Vega, who I mentioned at the beginning, talking about his own approach to time tracking, it really uh, hit me that that was it, that I, the, the thing I've made that should help me put me in that strange situation. So what did I do? I built another one. And this one, I tried to be much more conscious because I knew where the problem is. I tried to be much more conscious about how I shape that tool. So first of all, I'm really dividing work into personal things, which I do for myself or for exploration or for playing with stuff. And there's also work work, which is, still takes much more time. But nevertheless, I try to do something at least once a day. So this is the visualization I like to look up every morning. So each one of those uh, rectangles is a day in a year. And I put a red bar if I did, if I worked at all, and a blue bar if I worked on my own, my own things. So you can see in 2000, this is from a few months back right now, in 2016, I'm around 200 days spent where I did at least a little bit on my own projects. And you can see the pattern in here in 2016. When I start, I really keep on it because I don't like to break that chain. So I know it's not flashy, it's, it doesn't look really nice, but it needs to send me a message, and it does. And so for me, it has been really eye-opening to look at all the tools I make and all the, the languages I use, the ways of thinking I use, and how they shape everything about me. So it's really important to, to be able to, to step back and, and look at this from different perspective. Another thing with this is it goes down next 30 years. So it's about as much, I think, as I could help, hope to get. And it really puts me in this perspective. It's a little bit scary, but shows me uh, how I spend my time and forces me to think about what I want to do. So we tried, I tried to explore with you language and tools and thinking and making and, and show you how they all impact each other in these very strange ways. Because you make your tools and you think and make with language. And the tools you make and the things you work on and how you work on them shape your language, your ways of thinking. So just try to be conscious about it. And I really believe there's a lot to explore and, and play around. And this is just, I think, a tip of the iceberg, if not even. And I would say just try grabbing things which interest you, even if they are not your day-to-day -day developer designer job. Because I really believe there are some kind of meta ideas that float over what you work on on a daily basis. And if you really focus on only one thing, you don't see the spectrum. So for, from my perspective, even learning something like Clojure, if I do most of the work in JavaScript still, really changed how I think about the things I make and how I shape them. And it's the same in every aspect of, of working with things. So you can't expect to be creative and build up new things if you really look at one place and one place only. So, yeah, try to be conscious about it and, and explore and build things even if they don't make sense, really. So, thanks.